going to do a chapter six today during our remote learning phase and uh, just kind of see what's going on out here and uh, stay in contact send me questions you know my email or during uh, Google meets but uh, it's starting to become fall here you can see the beautiful colors kind of across the lake there but uh, stay positive uh, stay focused you know oh, you got some two swans out there looks like a little canoe or something a little rowboat maybe two people fishing off to the right there but uh, all right guys so here we go all right so we're gonna start with uh, chapter six here today and one thing is, and a lot of kids get confused by this, but it's so easy. A lot of kids get confused by the term republic or republican or republicanism. When you're talking about like forms of government, especially around the time of the revolution, all republic means is like without a monarch, without a monarchy. And so that's kind of a big thing. So um, when they talk about terms like republican motherhood, it's referring to without a monarchy. Well, we'll get to Republican motherhood in a moment. But Republicanism, this concept of not needing a monarchy, opposing a monarch, it just embeds in early American culture. It's a way of life. It's an ideology in America. And this Republicanism emphasizes liberty, freedoms, because a king or queen can, can snap, a, snap their fingers and take away your liberty. And so republics are, the foundation is on liberty. And we say also equality, that we're all equal before the law. Now you can definitely uh, say, well, this isn't true in all cases, you know, with slaves and women not having the right to vote. But um, the, in the early part of the American uh, experiment, some people call it, uh, there was lots of talk about liberty, lots of talk about equality, that we're all equal before the law, we all have certain rights, we all have certain inalienable rights. And the Founding Fathers, they constantly have tensions between liberty and order. We all say we want liberty, we all say we want order, but the honest truth is, if you have too much liberty, too much freedom to do whatever you want, you start to lose order. If I have the freedom to go like flip cars in the road and set them on fire, if I have that kind of liberty, then we start to lose order. But if we have too much order, where the government's regulating everything, controlling everything, big brothers looking over your shoulder, making sure you don't sneeze wrong or whatever, then you start to lose liberty. So the Founding Fathers know that we all want liberty, we all want order, because none of us want chaos, we all want freedoms, so we want liberty and order. But if you have too much of one, you start to lose the other. If you have too much of this one, you start to lose that. And the Founding Fathers are constantly debating that. Do we decide on order? Do we decide on liberty? And we still debate this to this day. For example, after 9-11, um, after the terrorist attacks, uh, the Patriot Act comes into existence. And the Patriot Act, a lot of people supported it because, hey, it's going to give us order. It's going to stop terrorist attacks. It's going to keep us safe. But a lot of people opposed those same Patriot Acts saying, Look, you're giving the government too much power to eavesdrop, to spy. We need to protect our liberty. And so we still have this liberty versus order debate all the way up until today. But the Founding Fathers were very um, keenly aware of this liberty versus order kind of dichotomy here. Um, and so African Americans start to push for more rights at the time of the Revolution. Uh, you know, hey, the revolution, the, the most sacred document of it, the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. We all have certain inalienable rights uh, given to us not by the government or any human, but by our, quote, creator. So how dare you take that away? So th these are still falling under African Americans kind of pushing for rights. Guys, one thing that's important to know is that uh, all 13 original states... You know, from Massachusetts, remember Maine was a part of Massachusetts back then. From Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia. And remember Florida is a part of Spain back then. But all of the original 13 states had slavery legal at some point. All had slavery legal at some point. Now some states, particularly those in the South, 
He had lots of slaves. Some had as many slaves as they had citizens. However, uh, the northern states tended to have um, fewer slaves than the southern states, a smaller percentage. And so the fact of the matter is, uh, the northern states start to abolish slavery during or shortly after the American Revolution. And a lot of those northern states are point blank saying, slavery is not congruent with the Declaration of Independence. We can't say, we believe all men are created equal, we all have inalienable rights like the right to our life, the right to our liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and then say, oh, but it's okay if I go buy another human being. So the northern states do realize, uh, at least uh, many of the politicians who are abolishing slavery, do realize the hypocrisy in slavery while holding on to the Declaration of Independence. And slavery is not as profitable in the north. The most profitable crops are, at the time, tobacco. Other profitable crops are um, sugar. Cotton will soon be a very profitable crop, especially with the cotton gin that's, that's about to be um, uh, widespread. And so uh, that's another reason why slavery just doesn't take hold in the North. Also, a lot of the Christian groups that are found in the North and Middle Colonies uh, tended to be more opposed uh, to slavery. And so you, you see a lot of these Christian groups, like the Quakers for one, and a little bit later on, not so much at this moment, but a little bit later on, uh, the Wesleyan group, uh, Christians, they, they're point blank saying like, and they point blank say, you can't be a follower of Jesus' principles and own other human beings at the same time and, and so forth. And, and they give their scripture justifications for it. There are also uh, many other churches, especially in the South, giving their scriptural uh, justifications for slavery. At the same time, there are some churches in the North giving scripture opposing it. Um, and so, but keep in mind... In the north, you have rockier soil. You don't have a great climate for the most profitable crops. Sugar doesn't grow well in the north. Cotton and tobacco. I mean, you can grow them in the north. It's just not as they're not going to grow as well in the north. And some people say, you know, the north might have behaved very similarly to the south had they had, you know, similar uh, climate and so forth. Uh, but guys, slavery in the south. Slavery seems to be on the decline. In fact, a lot of slave owners were freeing their slaves. Um, but then a couple things happen. Two things happen that make slavery more profitable again. New lands open up out west. Cotton depletes soil uh, pretty quick as it grows. And new lands open up in Alabama and Mississippi. And so now you have new uh, lush land to kind of use. But then also you get the cotton gin. And the cotton gin basically... Um, it's, it's this invention. Eli, uh, different people are credited with it, but Eli Whitney is kind of the American who puts a patent on it and gets it mass kind of used. But the cotton gin, it basically separates the seeds out from the fibers. And then slaves would kind of pick it with their hands and their hands will get gnarled. Eli Whitney is actually saying, look, I'm actually doing it to help the slaves, he says. Uh, you ever hear the saying, um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? <laughs> but... Uh, but he says, I'm doing this to help the slaves. But the fact of the matter is, um, because the, the slaves, with their hands would get all cut up. Because the cotton fibers were actually coarse before it was uh, uh, processed. And they would be picking them with their bare hands and kind of grind down and wear down on their, their hands and fingers and, and so forth. But the cotton gin, you basically, you just put it in and you, you crank the wheel. And then there's a screen kind of, or it's more of a grate. But then there's little hooks in it hooks onto the fiber, pulls the fiber through, the, the, the seeds can't get pulled through. So one person can do the work of like 20 to 30 and then even later 50 people picking the seeds out of the cotton fibers with one cotton gin. So it makes cotton more profitable and therefore slaves more profitable because everyone wants to wear cotton because once you process it, it's not as itchy and scratchy as, as a wool would be and silk's too expensive and you don't, you don't have modern like space age fabrics like polyester and crap um and so slavery becomes more profitable in the south you get benjamin banneker he's an african-american he's an astronomer a mathematician he's a brilliant mind and the sad fact is uh even thomas jefferson meets benjamin banneker who's who's uh you know doing some great things 
in the sciences here. And the fact of the matter is, Thomas Jefferson, even after meeting Benjamin Banneker, still holds the view in his private journals and so forth that black people can't become, you know, uh, scientists and mathematicians and advanced thinkers and astronomers and other stuff. And it kind of shows you how set in uh, bigotry some of the founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson were, who met Benjamin Banneker and was still holding... Um, African Americans kind of as this they have such an inferior mind that they can't do these things even after he met Benjamin Banneker who could and was doing those things so it's, it's kind of a kind of a just a sad thing you can see some of the fall colors there red orange yellow a little bit um, all right Republican motherhood so at the time of the founding of the Republic, the Republic is founded when we, at the revolution, because we no longer have a monarch, we no longer have a king, King George III. Um, so this this concept that women have a special place is the Republic requires the woman's role for survival. What is the woman's role for the survival of the Republic so we don't revert backwards into a monarchy? Well, women must be educated so that they can educate their sons to be future Republicans. Republican leaders and they need to educate their girls to be future Republican mothers. Notice the cementing of the gender norms and roles there. Uh, women are essentially um, kind of like housewives, you might say. Women, and you also get this this uh, this notion that women must keep their husbands virtuous citizens. That that wives must keep an eye on their husbands to make sure that they're not saying, oh, you know. Oh, I have this residual love for the king or future queen or whoever. That the women need to keep their husbands honest towards the republic. And and doesn't this reinforce gender norms? Now, on, on, on one thing, you know, it, it's bad because it's cementing gender norms. Another thing, you could say it's good because for the first time ever, throughout all of america people are saying and basically remember this is rare in the world at this time through all of america people are saying educate women and not just on reading and writing but educate women on government and the young girls who were grazed in the early stages of republican motherhood were people like elizabeth katie stanton and lucretia mott who host the seneca falls convention in 1848 so you could argue republican motherhood does some positives with women's rights, you could also say it does some negatives, like kind of cementing gender norms. You raise your boys to be future leaders. You raise your girls to be future Republican mothers. And you, and it's your job to keep your husbands honest uh, in terms of government. Um, was the American Revolutionary War revolutionary? This is your homework assignment. Some people say there wasn't because there was no mass restructuring of society. Most slaves were still slaves. Yeah, the northern states freed their slaves, but they had less than 10% of the slaves. It's easy for states to free slaves if they barely have any. It's harder for South Carolina to free slaves when half their state slaves because it's their economy. The rich people, it's their form of property. And you don't want to tick off the rich people because unfortunately the rich people have more say in society back then, more influence. And, and most poor are still poor. Most rich are still rich. Most slaves are still slaves. And a lot of people argue, look, this this isn't some mass restructuring of society. It's it's not some, you know, uh, world upside down, turned upside down. Most people are still in the same kind of roles they were in before. And the people who, and most of the people in charge of the national government, you know, they had important roles before that. Other people say, no, no, it still was, it still was revolutionary. Look, um, now you can have banks and Britain isn't limiting manufacturing. Yeah, we had some manufacturing, but Britain greatly limited it. And we slowly, slowly, but we slowly build that up. The American Revolution spurs the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution before the Haitian Revolution. Uh, revolutions even as late as the 1900s, 1800s uh, Latin American revolts are citing the American Revolution. It changes, a lot of people say, you know, the Declaration of Independence is a world history document, not a U.S. history document, because it spurs other revolutions. How is that not revolutionary, some people might say. Um, and you see more middle class people getting elected to the state levels, maybe not so much the, the national levels, but the state levels, the state congresses, you see more middle class people getting elected after the revolution. And the northern states... Yeah, they have few slaves, but they do free them. And they free them on the revolutionary idea of the Declaration of Independence. 
So it's a debate. It's your opinion. I can't tell you what's right. I can't tell you it's wrong. I can tell you if you're not backing it up with facts. I can tell you if you're not backing it up with uh, logical thinking. But there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer in it. Your homework's on that. you got to go into more detail than I just went in there. Uh, state governments. What are state governments starting to do at this time? Well, the state governments at this time, uh, they start coming up with new state constitutions during this era. And they're trying to solidify natural rights that we all are just born inherently with certain rights that can't justly be taken away. Inalienable rights. Um, and, uh, and in fact, eight of the 13 original state constitutions come out with declaration of rights, rights that their state governments cannot trample upon. The most famous was written by George Mason of Virginia for his state. And, and um, that there's just some rights that the state government can't take away from you. This is a big moment in world history, talking about whether you think it's revolutionary or not. We're putting down on paper that there are limits to government, that the government can never do certain things. And maybe we don't always follow through on it, but the fact is it's, it is a stepping stone. Now, is it a big enough stepping stone to be revolutionary? That's for you to decide, not for me to tell you. Uh, you could say yes, but you could also say, look, Mr. Morris, it wasn't until 1964 that people like MLK and uh, 1965 uh, with the Voting Rights Act, 1964, Civil Rights Act, 1965, Voting Rights Act. <laughs> you know, that's a like, gosh darn long. It's almost two full centuries after the revolution. Uh, state legislators had more power than governors due to old colonial fears of royal governors. Uh, there's this constant fear before the revolution of, of, of the royal governors. They have too much power. So a lot of the states designed their state congress, their state legislators, to have more power than the executive branch of their state, the governor. Um, and states had strong powers under the Articles of Confederation. It's not like today. States do have power today, but not nearly as much as they did under our previous form of government, the Articles of Confederation, which gets created by the Second Continental Congress. The Second Continental Congress, if you remember, declares uh, independence during the Revolution, prosecutes the war, and creates this Articles of Confederation. Articles of Confederation is going to fail. What is the Articles of Confederation here? Um... It goes against John Dickinson. You might remember him from Letters from a Pennsylvania Farmer. You might remember him from the Olive Branch Petition. Um, but John Dickinson, once we once we break off, and he kind of reluctantly or slowly agrees to break off, but he says we need a strong central government. And the Second Continental Congress reject his idea here. We need the states to have the power. Uh, we, we just fought this highly centralized government far, far, an ocean away. Well, if Philadelphia is going to be the capital, well, that's going to be far, far away too, you know, uh, based on, you know, the standards of the day. Remember, there are no, um, you know, remember there are no highways and trains and internet and cell phones. And so Philadelphia is a far way away from most of the colonies. And, <clears throat> and why would you want to trade a highly centralized government that was far away to one that's still kind of far away, just a little bit closer. So they wanted to keep the power spread out. There was a common thought with the founders with the Articles of Confederation that you prevent tyranny by spreading out the power. If the power isn't all in one location, then it's harder to have uh, tyranny and dictators and all the bad things you don't want. So the sovereignty is with the states and the Articles of Confederation. The national government's very weak with the Articles of Confederation. So this puts heavy constraints on the federal government, far more than the U.S. Constitution does, which comes later. And so it's, you know, we're, we don't want to create a new, a new London situation. And it's one vote per state. So the more populated states have the same say as the, the least populated states right? There's no independent executive. Some people try to say, oh, the first president was actually during the Articles of Confederation. Eh, no, it was, it was called, the title was President of Congress. There's no independent executive. There is an independent executive in the U.S. Constitution. There wasn't an Articles of Confederation. And the, the, the weakest aspect of this is what we're always worried about. No taxation without representation. There's no authoritative tax power. 
the national government can recommend that states pay taxes and then it's up to the states to follow through and it's up to the states to create the taxes themselves. And so this is just going to fall apart. And the states are constantly accusing states of not paying the right amount, paying too much. We paid more than we we're supposed to. We didn't pay enough. The states are constantly fighting over this, constantly arguing over this. And um, so basically, uh, that's kind of what's going on. Shay's Rebellion. I won't go, go into too much detail here. There, I will put a uh, video that you can watch about Shay's Rebellion that you might find interesting. But Shay's Rebellion. So Massachusetts is taxing and these farmers can't pay their taxes or so they're losing land some are, are the economy has has high inflation after the revolutionary War. the economy is struggling and the fact of the matter is uh a lot of these farmers are upset and so they start shutting down the courthouses so they can't uh evict people from their farms or put people in debtor prisons and once you lose your farm you lose the right to vote no taxation without representation and a lot of these people had fought in the american revolution who are now rebelling in shay's uh, rebellion shay's rebellions uh 18 um 1886 1887 and you know this the the, the american revolution officially ends 1783 so you're talking just a few years after the fact the last major battle of the american revolution would probably be considered to be yorktown 1781 so you can see it's just a handful of years after the after the revolution ends, and they're already saying, "Look, we're being taxed unfairly. We 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 lose our say when we lose our land because Massachusetts back then they had to own a certain amount of land to vote, unlike today." And so you know you have all these things kind of going on. The farmers shut down the courthouses because they don't want to get kicked off. And this leads to calls for a new constitution. And it's going to be a stronger national government that can enforce taxing rights. Um, and, and a lot of the more populated states under the new constitution are going to ask for more say. You know, hey, we, hey, we have more people. Give us more say. Um, and one of the things they have to come to an agreement with is when we become one country is Western land disputes. Did you guys know that Holland, Michigan, uh, multiple states had claimed Connecticut claimed the strip all the way across. Massachusetts claimed the strip all the way across. And we were in Massachusetts back then, kind of. Uh, Massachusetts claimed Holland. Um, at the same time, guys, um, you know, New York claimed where Holland is. And at the same time, uh, Virginia claimed where Holland So basically, to prevent states from fighting over land out west, we all... All the states who had, and plus a few states like Maryland didn't have Western land claims. And Maryland's talking about how they're going to shrivel up and die as Virginia has all this land out west. And they don't need to tax because they can just sell land as a form of tax, you know, to get revenue for the for the state government. And But Maryland has to tax, and so everyone in Maryland just moved to Virginia. And uh, to prevent the states from feuding or even fighting, all Western land disputes, all the land over the mountains... They're supposed to give up, um, <clears throat> and then the national government's going to have that land and sell that land and, and, and have lower taxes because they can sell that land. This leads to the Northwest Ordinance, which is going to create the Northwest Territory. And this is passed twice under both the Articles of Confederation in 1787, and then again later under the U.S. Constitution. And the land ordinance goes hand in hand with this, but it was actually started a little bit before. But the Northwest Ordinance is going to create the Northwest Territory. And this is modern day Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and a wee bit of Minnesota, right? And so, um, and then it's going to take the Northwest Territory and then help develop it. And then, uh, create clear titles to land they're going to create six mile by six mile townships and then uh the one of the middle sections here is going to go for public education all the land in one of the four middle sections i think it was section 16 there's 36 sections um because each section is one by one mile and each township is six by six miles if you look at a map of michigan a township map you can still see many of the old six by six mile township uh grids laid out across michigan and other states from the northwest territory like like indiana and so forth and um and they say that that section 16 that one by one mile thing 
all of that land sold is going to fund the public school, the creation of the public school. And then eventually, in theory, as it gets developed, then the local people can pitch and then pay. But all the land sold is going to build the local school and get it up and running. Um, and then it also says all slavery is abolished. You might notice in your documents that you're looking at for the homework this week that it says Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, and Illinois, all the states of the Northwest Territory, says that they have abolished slavery in 1787. That's because the Northwest Ordinance said slavery will not be permitted within the Northwest Territory. So Michigan has had slavery abolished illegal since 1787. Now there are some examples of people traveling through with slaves and so forth, but generally speaking, we haven't had slavery since 1787 in the state. You can find a few exceptions, but they're relatively not um, uh, common uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and uh, last but not least here, bef uh, to finish off chapter six before we get to chapter seven, uh, you have these nationalists who start arguing for the stronger government and for the U.S. Constitution. These are people like Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and Robert Morris. And um, now, Hamilton and Madison disagree on a lot. You know, he's a Jeffersonian Republican. He's a, he's a Federalist here. And But the fact of the matter is, they both see, uh, they're nationalists. They want, they want to strengthen national unity. They want, um, they think a stronger central government would be better than what we had under the Articles of Confederation. When, when Shays' Rebellion was going on and people were burning, uh, you know, uh, in uh, causing problems and, and, set, and taking over the courthouses and things like that, Thomas Jefferson was, was actually in France at the time and wrote back home, like, you know, uh, my biggest fear and our biggest worry is that we overreact and create too strong of a national government. It's good that these people are rioting, Thomas Jefferson said. In fact, Thomas Jefferson says the tree of, and I'm paraphrasing here, I might get it slightly wrong, but he says something to the effect of the tree of liberty must be refreshed. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants alike. And that it's good that uh, these people are revolting against the, the government because we want people to do that. If the government's becoming oppressive, people need to stand up and punch the government in the nose to say, we won't tolerate this. Whereas many other people uh, are just looking at what's going on in Shay's Rebellion with abject horror. What the heck is going on? These people are rioting. These people, it's chaos. It's not order. And so you can kind of see like, like Hamilton's like, we need to stop this. We need a stronger national government. It's embarrassing that the national government can't put down the small rebellion, Shay's Rebellion, and not quickly and effectively. And, um, and one thing Hamilton does to try to create national unity is uh, he says, look, most, not all, but most of the state debts were from the American Revolution. And so the national government should take on all the state debts to start off at the founding of the country to cement the country. <clears throat> and that kind of ties the states into the national government there. Um, <clears throat> but guys, hey, stay positive. Uh, stay focused. Ask me questions. Um, you know, and uh, guys, have a good day. And, you know, uh, stay on top of your work and uh, think about your future. And reach out, reach out. You know, I have office hours right now from 10 a.m. to noon on Fridays, at least for right now during the remote learning period. But uh, guys, have a good day and stay out of trouble.